Hello, my name is Carter Barnwell, and I'm a doctoral candidate in history at the University of New Mexico, and a proud recipient of the 2019 Latin American and Iberian Institute PhD Fellowship. I was awarded the fellowship to conduct archival research to support the writing of my dissertation on transnational cultural transfers of Spanish anti-fascism during the interwar era. My working title for the dissertation is War of Words, Gender, Culture, and Transnationalism in the Discourse of Spanish Anti-Fascism, 1923 to 1946. In the summer of 2018, I had the opportunity to travel to Spain for initial research on this project and identified archives in Madrid, Alcalá de Henares, and Salamanca, to which I hope to return in the fall of last year. Due to family health issues and now international travel restrictions, my trip to Spain has been delayed. And thus to date, my research is focused on American sources in East Coast archives. With this pivot, my attention has turned to aspects of my project that can be researched while in the US and that will inform my dissertation. I've been focused on the agency of American volunteers in the Spanish Civil War in a time of increasing governmental structuring working primarily in the National Archives in Washington, D.C., and with the Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archives at NYU, the Archives of the City College of New York, and at the Paley Center for Media in Manhattan. I have long been interested in some of the political, social, and cultural outcomes of World War I. I am convinced that these outcomes had a profound influence on Spain even as a non-combatant in the Great War, and I look forward to fleshing this influence out further in the coming year. My research project on anti-fascist discourse has been informed generally by a body of sociological theory which really initiated in the interwar era, as theorists began to revisit the concept of the nation state itself and to ask what it was and how it maintained control over its citizenry. In 1919, the German sociologist Max Weber declared that the state is an entity that maintains a monopoly on the legitimate use of violence within its boundaries, and that this was the principal way in which it maintains dominance over the governed. Several years later, Antonio Gramsci would suggest a more nuanced relationship between the state and civil society, one in which governing elites maintained hegemony less through force than through ideology. Imprisoned by Mussolini in 1926, Gramsci's prison notebooks constitute the ultimate anti-fascist project. Expanding on Gramsci's work, Louis Althusser would much later distinguish between repressive and ideological state apparatuses, explaining that these entities work in tandem to manufacture the consent of the governed in the modern nation state. The former, or RSAs, are made up of the police and the military, for example, which have license to repress civil society when necessary. ISAs, by contrast, are comprised of schools and churches, but also of radio broadcasts, film and books devoted to persuasion rather than repression. To prepare for my examination of the state and civil society in Spain, I have been focusing attention on the actions of government at local and national levels in the United States of the 1930s, and especially its treatment of American volunteers in the Spanish Civil War. My research so far has shown that the US government was engaged in contradictory projects during the 1930s, as the Roosevelt administration's cultural programs groomed a generation of American anti-fascists, even in spite of official government policy restricting intervention in foreign wars from January of 1937. Hollywood's culture industry productions of the 1930s reinforced popular sentiment against creeping European authoritarianism. Movies, books, plays, and demonstrations, along with Roosevelt's own public speeches and New Deal program rhetoric, delivered to national audiences as early as February 1933, fostered a suspicion of fascist objectives amongst the general American audience. These cultural projects created structures of feeling that for many were summed up in the term anti-fascism itself, and which produced, in Michael Denning's phrase, a cultural front. Simultaneously, the House Special Committee on Un-American Activities, informally known as the McCormick-Dickstein Committee and later as HUAC, 
began to investigate communist and fascist rhetoric within the United States in 1933. Later HUAC hearings targeted Hollywood and the culture industry more broadly, creating bodies of knowledge and categories of analysis for holding citizens in official contempt of the state. American volunteers in Spain's civil war would be especially scrutinized for their perceived affiliation with international communism. The committee's hearings and deliberations are rich with detail of how identifying internal enemies would become strictly a search for communist tendencies in the U.S. and how the term anti-fascist would be reconstructed as communist. At the State Department, the new designation premature anti-fascist would become code for suspected communist. McCormick-Dickstein committee investigations would help create a body of knowledge about anti-fascism that would serve the needs of the coming Cold War. While also providing a template for constructing anti-communist narratives that would be imitated by other Western governments. Such narratives would ultimately allow Spanish General Francisco Franco to be rehabilitated in the international community as the self-described sentinel of the West against communism. Declared fascist by the United Nations in 1946, Franco would rebrand himself and his regime anti-communist by the end of the decade. The Generalissimo's relief at this turn of events is evident here in his quite literal embrace of President Eisenhower in 1953. The McCormick-Dickstein Committee's conclusions recommended more latitude for the state in dealing with its citizenry, including limiting freedom of speech to non-subversive discourses in all cases. Interestingly, the committee adopted the term fifth columnist to describe the behavior of perceived subversives, making immediate use of a term that had just been coined in another context during the first year of the Spanish Civil War. This episode highlights the concern of national governments with maintaining a monopoly on violence over their respective citizenry and details the processes through which sedition was redefined and recategorized during the interwar era. Similar processes would be used by Spanish nationalists to construct internal enemies during and after their uprising against the Republican government in 1936. Hugh Heklos tells us that nation-states in the modern era puzzle before they power. During the interwar era, states amassed information and created discourses around what constituted responsible citizenship prior to enacting repressive legislation. Yet for activist citizens on the ground, this governmental puzzling process produced messages that were often contradictory in nature. Many volunteers in the Spanish Civil War would be deemed premature anti-fascists upon their return home. But did the state itself create these lawbreakers through its own anti-fascist rhetoric? My current research addresses this possibility while exploring the impact of Spanish anti-fascist discourse on American citizens. I'm extremely grateful to the Latin American and Iberian Institute of the University of New Mexico for supporting my project, and I look forward to sharing some conclusions with the LAII community in the months to come.